Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. President Biden driving home his American jobs plan in Metro Detroit, pushing a $174 billion investment in electric cars. The future of the auto industry is electric. There's no turning back. An almost uninterrupted presidential tradition is back. The Bidens releasing their tax returns, how much they made and what they paid coming up. And in North Carolina, no criminal charges for the deputies who shot and killed Andrew Brown Jr. last month. After reviewing the investigation conducted by the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, Mr. Brown's death, while tragic, was justified. We started today with President Biden's tour of Ford's electric vehicle plant. NBC News correspondent Mike Memley is in Dearborn, Michigan. Mike, the president wants to invest $174 billion in electric cars. How's he pitching that in Dearborn today? Well, Allison, I thought we had reached uh, peak Joe Biden a few weeks ago when I was talking to you from outside the Amtrak station in Philadelphia. <laughs> you saw him speaking before those Acela cars. Uh, today was pretty much the quintessential uh, President Biden type of event. He was uh, in the heart of the auto industry here in the Detroit area, talking to union workers surrounded by these pickups and trying to make the argument that investing in this new battery technology uh, in the cars of the future was essential not just for jobs, for our climate picture, but for boosting American and competitiveness as well. And then he tied it all in, of course, to that multi-trillion dollar American jobs and family plan. Take a listen. The American jobs plan invests in new and retooled union facilities, grants to kickstart new battery and parts production, loans and tax credits to boost manufacturing of these clean vehicles. It also makes the largest investment in research and development in generations that's going to help innovate, manufacture and build supply chains. So Biden came to this particular plant because he wanted to get a sneak preview of Ford's new Lightning. It's an F-150 all electric pickup truck. And to borrow your pun, he drove the point home after his remarks. He went to a testing site uh, just a, a, a few miles from here. And actually, we never see this. A president behind the wheels driving himself uh, one of these new pickups. The last time I saw Joe Biden driving a pickup was in 2008. He was uh, still Senator Joe Biden uh, getting ready to be named as a Barack Obama's running mate. So a rare picture, but it looked like the president really enjoyed himself yeah. firing that sucker up, as he put it. That, that guy went fast. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, first of all, uh, you're welcome to borrow that pun anytime. It's here to share. Uh, I think you might be right. I thought we had hit kind of max peak Joe Biden weeks ago. But the aviators, the test driving the car, I'm watching him and I, I'm thinking, he, is he even, it looks like he's going off the path a little bit. Like he just looked like he was having a really good time. And you bring up a great point. When was the last time you saw a, a sitting president, a, a president behind the wheel of a car that usually in the back seat getting driven around? Peak Joe Biden. Biden, indeed. Uh, the president, though, with a serious message today, Mike, saying China is beating the U.S. in the auto race. Here he is. Right now, China is leading in this race. Make no bones about it. It's a fact. You know, we used to invest more in research and development than any country in the world. And China was number eight. Or excuse me, number nine. We now are number eight, and China's number one. Can't let that be sustained. So, Mike, how does the president plan to get the U.S. back in the lead here? Yeah, I mean, China is a huge part of the White House's messaging on this. China has doubled their manufacturing of electric vehicles since 2010. Uh, and the way that, the reason that he came to this specific plant has to do with, uh, you know, diversifying the kind of electric vehicles we see on the roads. You think of an electric vehicle and you think of a Prius. Well, that pickup truck is key. Uh, 300,000 electric vehicles will, were sold in this country last year. 800,000 pickup trucks bought last year. And a great stat from Josh Letterman that I'm 
borrowing uh, as well. And so as you talk about that $174 billion uh, package here that involves electric vehicles, uh, $15 billion, uh, billion of that would go towards adding a half a million electric tr uh, vehicle charging stations across the country. Another $14 billion of that would be incentives to help sort of boost the production of these mid and heavy duty style uh, trucks that most clearly Americans want. Uh, but that was obviously the, the message as part uh, of the president's push, trying to make the point that if we don't make these kind of investments, China is going to continue to own the electric vehicle market. And as he yeah. puts it, the U.S. should be owning that electric vehicle market. Mike, people might not know this, but Dearborn has a large Arab American population. The Detroit Free Press reporting that the section of Dearborn that's home to that particular Ford plant is more than 90 percent Arab American Muslim. Uh, we have been hearing about protests there during the president's visit over the fighting between the Israeli and the Palestinians. What have you seen and heard there today? Yeah, Allison, obviously there's the foreign policy argument the president wanted to make today about China, but very clearly a split screen yeah. moment uh, with the situation in the Middle East dominating the headlines and really competing for the attention of the president today. Uh, you mentioned there was a, a demonstration we attended earlier uh, this morning, spoke with some community leaders who said, listen, uh, they helped put President Biden in the White House. His support in Dearborn itself was a big part of his overall winning margin here in the state of Michigan, which of course was so important nationwide. And they want to see him do more to support the Palestinian side here. As they said, you don't have to be anti-anything to be pro-Palestinian. Mike, uh, you mentioned it, a big part of what was going on there today, even if not planned. Mike Memoli, uh, peak Joe Biden today for sure. Uh, thanks so much uh, for showing us that video. That was terrific. Thanks, Allison. President Biden trying to navigate shifting Democratic politics on Israel. In his latest analysis, NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen saying voices critical of Israel are growing louder, more urgent and more mainstream in the wake of the current hostilities. And the president hasn't budged. John is with me live now. Uh, John, always great to see you. A real serious one today. Uh, in your analysis, you write that U.S. officials have not called on their Israeli counterparts to alter or halt their response to Palestinian rocket fire. That puts the administration at odds with the growing set of Democratic voters and elected officials who are casting a critical eye and harsh language at Israel. You say this reflects a gradual shift over the last dozen years or so. Talk us through what's changed for the Democrats. It's a great question, Allison. Let me just start with uh, this, though. Uh, when you're listening to statements from the Biden administration and others calling for a cease, not calling for a ceasefire, but saying they're supportive of a ceasefire, that's diplomatically very different than calling for a ceasefire. So they would welcome it, but right. they're not putting any pressure on Israel to, uh, as I wrote, to alter or halt uh, its campaign of retaliation against the, the Palestinian rocket fire. What's really changed here over the years, um, you know, has a lot to do with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the leader of Israel, who was sharply critical of Barack Obama and the Iran nuclear deal, and then turned around and locked arms uh, with President Donald Trump, the Republican. So uh, Democrats don't see a lot of elected Democrats don't see a lot of purchase in, um, you know, aligning with uh, Netanyahu, at least certainly not as much as they used to. Uh, and they certainly have a, a dim view of uh, the way that he has played um, politics from yeah. Israel within the United States. Uh, but in addition to that, you've got uh, Democratic voters and some elected officials who are really taking a second look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for uh, the, the first time in a long time. And, and basically, uh, the social justice element of the Democratic Party is, uh, you know, has to wrestle with uh, wanting changes to systemic injustices here um, you know, versus what's going on over there, where there is, you know, generational poverty and systemic injustice uh, in, the, in the Gaza Strip. What we have not seen, though, is any real shift in the substance in Washington. That is to say, um, yeah. you know, the administration and the majority in Congress are still he heavily supportive of Israel's right to defend itself. And um, and the voices uh, have shifted a little. The rhetoric shifted because the party politics with the Democratic Party have changed them. Mm -hmm. All right, John, uh, the president really getting it on on both sides, right, from progressives and some moderates. Let me start by asking you about progressive Democrats. They want the Biden administration, some of them, to stop a seven hundred thirty five million dollar weapons deal with Israel. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar in particular saying if this goes through, this will be seen as a green light for continued escalation and will undercut any attempts at brokering a ceasefire. What else uh, can the White House do to ease the pressure from progressives in particular? 
<laughs> I mean, I think they would benefit from uh, a cessation of hostilities. That is to say, if uh, Hamas stopped firing rockets into Israel and Israel also determined not to retaliate because, uh, you know, Netanyahu said the other night that he, um, you know, essentially expects this to be a prolonged campaign. Um, it, I think a ceasefire would be helpful to the administration in terms of uh, in terms of quieting some of the voices of dissent and criticism mm -hmm. uh, that President Biden has not been uh, using his leverage with Israel to lean on them harder. Um, at the you know at the same time, uh, I think they um, they're doing what they can rhetorically to uh, to try to um, you know at least uh, acknowledge the the fact that there is uh, destruction going on. Um, you know, in Gaza and, and that there's been violence uh, in, in East Jerusalem. But again, one more time, it, that's not changing the policy. And if anything, the policy of the United right. States under the Biden administration has been to give space to Netanyahu to operate as he sees fit. Look, John, it's not just progressives, right? You write about this. And, and maybe this is what President Biden should be most concerned about or, or listening to. But more moderate Democrats like Senator Bob Menendez, who chairs the Foreign Relations Committee and is a strong supporter of Israel, as you mentioned in your piece, saying there should be a full accounting for the strikes that kill innocent civilians. What else are you hearing from traditionally pro-Israel Democrats or Jewish Democrats on the Hill right now? And that's really it, Allison. I mean, this is the change. The big change is in the rhetoric on Capitol Hill from moderates like Senator Menendez and a, a dozen uh, Jewish Democrats mm -hmm. in the House last week who wrote a letter to President Biden. And the shift in that rhetoric is uh, is really talking about uh, Israel's uh, need to be transparent about uh, the decisions that it's making and also to, uh, you know, to to not target civilians and, and to take more care. As Secretary of State Tony Blinken put it, um, that Israel has a, a basically a higher responsibility for for not killing civilians uh, than do um, you know, terrorists firing rocket in, rockets into Israel. So, um, you know, I think again, this is largely a rhetorical shift, but you see it across mm -hmm. the spectrum of the Democratic yeah. Party, where uh, it's more of a two sided issue today, uh, and it's a more active debate mm -hmm. within the Democratic Party than it ever has been. Yeah, it is certainly a devastating situation in the Middle East that is putting some pressure on the president. John Allen, we always love seeing you. Thanks so much for being on. My pleasure, Allison. Israel and Hamas trading new attacks today, ignoring President Biden's support for a ceasefire. One rocket strike killing at least two Thai workers in southern Israel, according to Israeli police. Palestinians going on strike across the region today, protesting Israel's military action. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin is in Tel Aviv tonight. Aaron, uh, we usually hear about new strikes around this time of night. What is it like in Tel Aviv right now? Well, the situation here, Allison, is tense as the violence continues. We were just on the phone with our sources in Gaza. They say that the Israeli airstrikes continue over the southern part uh, of Gaza. This, in addition to the violence that we saw uh, earlier today, a uh, rocket fire from Gaza into Israel, striking an Israeli settlement to the south of Israel, killing two foreign nationals, injuring seven, adding to the Israeli death toll, 12 killed so far in this conflict. In, in terms of the Gaza death toll, some 212 Palestinians killed, more than 60 of them uh, being children. Of some 40,000 displaced, according to the United Nations. And it's that toll that is sparking international outrage, as well as outrage here in Israel, as well as other parts of the Middle East. As you mentioned, uh, Palestinians called for a general strike uh, throughout Israel, as well as the West Bank, as well as Jerusalem. Thousands turned out today in the streets of Ramallah, and that quickly devolved into clashes throughout the West Bank, as well as parts of eastern Jerusalem, killing three Palestinians. And there's really no end at this point to the violence in sight. Aaron, we've been talking so much about what uh, the leaders involved here are going to do about it, what even the White House might try to do about the situation. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the fighting today. What is he saying? Well, today he said that he is going to continue with this Israeli military operation for as long as necessary, giving few clues as to when it might end, despite international 
pressure to bring it to a close. So far, Israel uh, resisting that pressure, even uh, a phone call with President Biden, President Biden uh, saying that he supports the ceasefire, uh, stomping short of directly calling for that ceasefire, as many within the president's own party are pushing him to do. So a lot of pressure coming in from all sides uh, for Israel to bring this to a close. All right, Aaron McLaughlin reporting for us from Tel Aviv. Aaron, thank you. Stay safe. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She's got the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Hey, Simone. Hey, Allison, we're going to start with this. Pharmaceutical company AbbVie is under scrutiny for inflating the prices of Humira and Imbruvica for the last two decades in the U.S. The House and Oversight Reform Committee report found the price increases landed the company billions in revenue and hefty bonuses for executives. Now, AbbVie didn't respond to a request for comment. But well, we're keeping an eye on the Florida Senate race. House Democrat Val Demings is planning to challenge Republican Senator Marco Rubio in the 2022 midterms. Demings is the most high profile contender for the Florida Senate seat. She served as an impeachment manager in the first Senate trial of former President Trump. And a ransomware attack hit the Thai affiliate of Paris-based insurance company AXA. The Russian-speaking cyber criminals claim they stole three terabytes of data containing medical records, customer IDs, as well as private communications with hospitals and doctors. The attack is affecting operations in Thailand, Malaysia, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. And the inspector who failed to take note of a crack on the I-40 bridge connecting Arkansas and Tennessee has been fired. The Arkansas Department of Transportation released a drone video of the crack from May 2019, adding the inspector didn't report didn't report the crack that fall or the following year. In Ohio, seeing a spike in COVID vaccinations after Governor Mike DeWine's announcement of a million dollar lottery for vaccinated Ohioans. The state saw its highest vaccination rate in three weeks. For people ages 30 to 74, it spiked 6%. So Allison, I guess some of these incentives are working. I'm just curious though, if you just sign up to win a million dollars, how do they vet that you're actually getting the shot? Yeah, they got to be confirming that one because I feel like you get a whole lot of people on that list. But, hey, they know how to get people to get the shot, offer them a shot at a lot of money. That's for sure. Uh, Simone, thank you. No criminal charges. A North Carolina district attorney saying the sheriff's deputies who shot and killed Andrew Brown Jr. last month were justified. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck has more on today's announcement. Today, the district attorney here in Elizabeth City announcing there will be no criminal charges for the officers involved in the death of Andrew Brown, saying they used reasonable force because Brown was an immediate threat to their safety and well-being, as well as to his community. They say that Brown used his vehicle as a deadly weapon, posing a threat to officers and those in the area. They say that they do not feel that criminal charges would be necessary in this case because the Constitution and state laws were upheld and at no point uh, was their thinking unreasonable or illegal. Now, Brown's family has had a much different interpretation of that video from the start, calling this decision a slap in the face to them and to the community and demanding that the Justice Department get involved. Another qualm they spoke about was the fact that the district attorney did not contact them first with the outcome of this investigation before announcing it to the media. Earlier today, the district attorney defending his statements here. I think Mr. Brown's intention was to get away. I think Mr. Brown was fleeing an arrest because Mr. Brown had drugs uh, on his person and in his car. And I think he did not want to get caught with those. Uh, so that's why I think Mr. Brown was fleeing. The officer's position around the car uh, is why he drove at them. He had no choice. If he was going to attempt to flee, he had no choice but to drive directly at the officers. When he did that and he made that decision on his own, he placed their lives in danger. When the district attorney was asked why he didn't contact the Brown family, he referenced a very tense relationship with Brown's family and attorneys and said he hadn't done it yet, but would be willing to have a conversation with them later about everything he discussed in that press conference. He also said that he never considered recusing himself from the case, despite demands to do so from the Brown family, because he feels that although he has relationships with these officers, he's also an elected official in this area and accountable to the people here to be impartial. 
NBC Nightly News host Lester Holt taking his Across America series to Louisville tonight to talk with Police Chief Erica Shields. She was tapped to lead the department after Breonna Taylor was shot and killed. Here's a preview of their conversation about race and policing. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? Oh, I know there is. I know there is. I mean, I employ human beings. They come to the table. They develop inherent biases. Um, data supports that all day long. I think I, that now I think it's important to distinguish that that's not saying police are racist. I think that what happens is we focus on the end result and not the process. You can catch more of Lester's conversation with Chief Shields tonight on Nightly News at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Maricopa County still auditing the presidential election more than six months after Joe Biden was declared the winner. Now even some members of the GOP are saying it's time to stop. Supervisor Hickman has even been accused of feeding ballots to hundreds of thousands of chickens at his farm and then purposefully incinerating them. It's time to be done with this craziness and get on with our county's critical business. We ran a bipartisan, fair election. I supported an audit. I supported cooperating with the Senate. What I didn't support is a mockery. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson has more on the GOP infighting over Arizona's election audit. Yeah, Allison, this is really dramatic because it's the first time we've really heard from the board and they were not afraid to speak out. I mean, the, the word bubble is enormous on this, calling uh, the audit inept, a sham, a con, a threat to democracy, a mockery of the state of Arizona. All of this in a deluge of comments. Uh, very recently, a, a meeting yesterday, they held to specifically address this because they say this has been going on too long, that it is, again, a threat to their uh, system there in Maricopa, uh, and then it's not doing anything. Just to catch you up, the subpoena election material came at about February or so. The judge issued that order. All the election materials, including 2.1 million ballots, the entirety of ballots in Maricopa County, taken uh, to the Veterans Memorial Coliseum, where they're being counted by hand. This is happening, of course, because Trump supporters during the election said there was always a problem with some of these election machines. So they wanted to recount everything. Uh, the company that is overseeing this was subcontracted by the Republican-controlled state Senate. They're called Cyber Ninjas. As far as anybody knows, they have absolutely no election auditing experience. So you have this company with no experience, watchers inside of there, because there aren't journalists allowed, so we can only get reports from people that are actually seeing the process, say bizarre things are happening, like uh, some of the workers using UV lights to try to see if there's watermarks or bamboo in some of the paper because maybe there's tampering from an Asian country. All of these are really QAnon theories, not amounting to anything. Uh, but while it may seem like a waste of time or a joke to people across the country, people of Maricopa are very worried that this is a waste, again, of money, of resources, of time. And this sets a dangerous precedent for the rest of the country. Here is what some of the board supervisors said about what's going on. Listen to this. The election wasn't in question until a couple days after the final vote count. That's when all of a sudden, whoa, there might be a problem. We don't like who won the election. So let's call into question. Let's start rumors and unfounded statements and conspiracies. Let's throw these out there. Let's do everything we can to undermine the will of the voter, undermine our democracy. Let's do everything we can. No one, I believe for myself, never thought it would last this long. 195 days, we're still talking about it. Six months later. And that company, Cyber Ninjas, was paid $150,000 of taxpayer money from the state Senate's budget. So there's obviously some concern about where that's coming from. And to keep funding the operation, they're using fundraising methods through dark money. In other words, donors where we don't know where the sources of money is coming from. So of great concern to the board. The board, by the way, mostly Republicans, they're saying they're getting intimidation threats and even death threats. They've had to get the sheriff's department involved. So they want this to end as soon as humanly possible. 
President Biden and Vice President Harris releasing their 2020 tax returns, a tradition former President Trump ignored. CNBC political reporter Christina Wilkie joins me now. Uh, Christina, the first couple made just over $607,000 last year, pretty big drop from 2019. What else did we learn from their 2020 tax returns? We learned that they paid about $150,000 in federal income tax, which works out to a tax rate of about 27 percent. They also made $30,000 worth of charitable donations. And we also saw that their income came mostly from Social Security, from pensions and from Dr. Jill Biden's speaking fees, because, as you remember, last year, Joe Biden was on the campaign trail, so he wasn't giving those lucrative executive speeches. All right. So let's talk about Vice President Harris and her husband. They make close to one point seven million in 2020. Where'd all that money come from and what does their tax bill look like for the year? The majority of that money came from Doug Emhoff, Vice President Harris's husband. He is a partner at DLA Piper, the big international law firm. So that's where the bulk of their income came from. But Vice President Harris also reported three hundred thousand dollars in income from her book, from her 2019 book and another 174000 from her Senate salary. Christina, President Biden's been pitching tax hikes on corporations and the wealthiest Americans to pay for his spending programs. Both the president and vice president would pay more in taxes if they kept up their 2020 income levels. Where is this battle over tax hikes today? So as we sit here this afternoon, Senate Republicans are meeting with White House negotiators in the Capitol to see if they can come up with any alternatives to raising taxes that would fund Biden's $2 trillion infrastructure program. So they're talking about potentially using user fees like drivers would pay who are on the newly improved roads or potentially repurposing some coronavirus relief funds. Or they're also talking about going after tax cheats, which the White House says could raise as much as $700 billion. But here is where it gets tricky. The White Seems, House has mm-hmm. said no oh, to right. mm-hmm. no to user f- no to user fees because they say that it amounts to a tax cut on the middle class. Got and it. Senate Republicans have said absolutely not to any tax hikes. So right there, while we are um, while while we the two sides are talking right now, they remain very far apart. Yeah, it sounds like they got a lot of ground to cover there. And it sounds like you might have a little one who's calling for you. I love that. Uh, one of the beauties uh, of the pandemic work life, we're all spending a little bit more time with family and with work all blending together. <laughs> Christina, we love having you on News Now. Thanks for being here. Congratulations. You just landed your first job, but with remote work still going strong, it might be really tough to navigate your new workplace and make a great first impression. Morning Joe co-host and Know Your Value founder Mika Brzezinski is here with some tips to help young women get ahead at work. Mika, making that strong first impression, figuring out where you fit into a new work environment is always tough. It's always important, though. Uh, But now with remote work, it's even harder. How can young women break through in their first job if they are doing it from home? Well, this is all you got, this square right here, okay, if you're on Zoom. So let's make (laughs) it work, okay? Let's make it, like, effective and make it last. Um, So you want to stand out. You never turn your video off. You never, ever, ever turn unmute, mute, and do something else. You got to be there for those Zooms and be in that box and show with your face and your posture and your eye contact how much you want to be there, even, like, an eager sort of, and I, I, I mean it in a very positive way, but those energetic eyes that show that you're so interested in being in this job. Focus on your strengths when they come to you. What is it that you can bring to the table on a certain project? Ask questions. Uh, always engage in any way you can. Practice being engaged in conversations on Zoom. It can be awkward and uh, 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 different people are overlapping. It's okay. Get used to that. <laughs> (laughs) And and practice kind of this whole new medium that we're working on. Um, And always, if you're starting out, it's that first or second job, or you're starting out a new job, uh, pay attention to the details, even the simplest tasks. Do them as well as you can. Do them perfectly if it's a simple task. Showing that you care even about the smallest things says a lot about the value that you want to bring to the table. 
Mika, one thing a lot of young women struggle with early on, quite frankly, uh, women struggle with early on uh, at, at any stage. You don't have to be young, right? It is knowing our value. We will take on a ton of extra work to be liked or to make a good first impression, and then you just burn out. What should you do? What shouldn't you do when you're new to a job? Okay, so a couple of things. First of all, we're in a really weird time because we're on Zoom, but we yeah. might be going back in soon. And if it's a new job, you're, you're on Zoom, and then you're also going to be dealing with the uh, social-emotional crisis of stepping out of your sweats and going into a building again soon. Yeah. So that's take, keep in mind that's a lot, actually. For people who have been cooped up, especially young people, this has been a really tough year. So understand that you may feel some anxiety that you didn't expect about yourself. And so within all that, you want to make a good impression. So address that up front with yourself. Think of, of ways and strategies that you can help yourself feel better about getting back in, maybe even just validate that you're feeling this way. And you can talk to other people about it. I'm sure everybody else is going through it too. And I know from talking to uh, managers and vice presidents and people all the way up the flagpole here at NBC and Comcast, they're worried about the younger generation, about making sure we retain young talent here at this company. And they're worried about that re-entry being successful for them. Really good companies are considering this. They're knowing that this is going to be a very tough transition. Then, then the, the basics on making a good impression. Of course, focus on your strengths and always learn to talk about what the value it is that you bring to the table without it being uncomfortable or awkward. Um, you want to show real curiosity in, in lots of jobs, but you don't want to get pigeonholed into that person where they throw everything at you and you're always that person who's doing everything but nothing well. It's okay at the beginning of your career, but at the middle of your career, you need to start defining yourself. You need to start realizing what it is that you do best and trying to focus the jobs you get on your 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 best strongest qualities and a lot of that has to do with being able to communicate effectively because you can't get those jobs or you know those projects unless you ask for them and you know what it is that you do well knowing your value is not just about your monetary value but it's knowing what it is that you bring to the table and communicating that effectively. And then the, the final thing I will say to especially younger women, when you are meeting people in the workplace, and I urge you to meet everybody up and down the ladder at your company and have coffees and learn about di people, different people with different backgrounds, because you never know where everybody in this company is going to end up. And you really want to practice right. having good, strong relationships with people until it starts to come naturally for you. But you don't want to become chatty Kathy in the, in the office, doing the office gossip and chatty, 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 or here's my problem right. with this person. This is, this is very negative, very dangerous territory. You want to conduct yourself in a yeah. way where you command respect first with the people around you. You're talking about the work. You're interested in their background because you care as a person. You never want to gossip about mm -hmm. other people. Being friendly right. is not for the workplace. That's for like your girlfriend, your best friend from forever with wine on a Friday right. night. The office is about garnering respect first, and then friendships will follow, a few of them, in the years down the road. But I right. do think some women make the mistake of trying to be friends with everybody, and they kind of get in too deep in an area that's not appropriate. Gossip, chatty, chatty, chatty. No, 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 no. That's not what I mean when I, when I talk about really getting right. to know the, the people in your company and developing those relationships over time, they should be relationships based on respect. You're there to build that respect, not to make a bunch of friends. That's what Friday night is for. Some of the friends will come, as you've said. Uh, Mika, one That's awesome right. know your value tip, though. Build a committee at work, an alliance of coworkers mm -hmm. who are both senior and on your level. How can young women do that, and why is that so very important? Yeah, uh, they, they should do that. It is hard. 
Um, but you got to start reaching out. Yeah. And you have it, it. You know, I know when younger women reach out to me, they, they're trying so hard to figure out what to talk about. And I want to help them. Usually <laughs> when you see someone who's struggling, you help bring them all along a little bit and that will happen. But as you build your respect in the workplace, your name, you know, reach out to people and have coffee, uh, develop a support system again. Now, when I talk about chatty Cathy or gossiping, I don't mean you can't talk about your life or you can't ask other people right. about their life because within those conversation comes the support system. When you're having kids or you're getting married and you're building your life outside of work, the most important thing a company can do is to understand what your life needs in order that, that you can bring the best value to the table. So those conversations are really important. It's really important you conduct them well, that you're not just sitting around with a litany of complaints about your life to people, but you're sharing of yourself and you're learning about what other people need because all of that information can be vital in a negotiation if it's used in a positive and a constructive way. Mika, young people, college grads uh, entering a new workplace that is, quite frankly, just a little bit weird right now. Thank you Very so weird. much for uh, helping us to help them get through it. It's an odd time, but, but we're going to figure it out. Yes, we will. Thank you. Amazon goes to the movies, stock portfolios for teens and home construction taking a hit. It is time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's happening in the business world and beyond. Investopedia editor-in-chief Caleb Silver joining me now. Caleb, earnings season wrapping up. We've got some big retail names reporting today, Walmart, Home Depot. Uh, what did they tell us about the economy and consumer spending? It's strong. Con the consumer spending is very strong. And it was at Walmart in the first quarter, as it was at Home Depot, both reporting revenue up about 37 percent, both online and offline, extremely strong for both of them. So people are going into the stores to buy things. They're also continuing those online e-commerce orders. That's very good. Look at those sales for Walmart in the first quarter, $138 billion. I was impressed with Amazon at $110 billion. This blows them out of the water. I looked through the earnings uh, releases today. No mention of inflation on either earnings release. That's funny, but the inflation is everywhere you look, as we've been talking about, Allison. And the average ticket price at Home Depot per customer was up eight, was 82 bucks last quarter, last month. That's up 10%. So that shows you that people are paying more every time they go in. 82 bucks per ticket is a pretty good number for them. Wow. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Caleb, uh, we also got some housing data today. April housing starts down nearly 10 percent, according to the Commerce Department. Builders are saying they're putting down foundations and then waiting to frame them. And they're not lying. There's a home across the street from me. I've been staring at the foundation for months now and they're not putting up any lumber. Uh, what is going on here and what does that drop mean for the housing market? Yeah, well, you just said the word lumber. Lumber prices have almost doubled this year uh, because there's so yeah. much demand for it. Plus, there was a little bit of a tariff issue with Canada, one of our biggest um, and one of the biggest exporters of lumber to the U.S. So there's that. And demand was surging because interest rates have been so low. They're climbing now. Mortgage rates were down you know, below 3 percent. They're climbing now. But those lumber prices and copper prices, thank you, Cosmo Castorini from Moonstruck, those are really expensive, too. Those all go into building homes, and that's causing uh, real builders and developers and even homeowners to slow down their role in terms of building and starting new homes because it's getting more expensive. Caleb, a lot of talk lately about the millennial wealth gap. Fidelity launching no-fee youth accounts. They let teens trade stocks. Why is it so important for this next generation to get in the game? Well, we need financial literacy. We need financial education. We need investing education. We yeah. believe that wholeheartedly. I applaud this effort. Fidelity's got a lot of customers and about $10.5 trillion under management. They know that of the 4 million customers they signed up last year, most of them were under the age of 35 years old. That tells you that there's a younger cohort that wants to get into this. They've looked at Robinhood and the success that Robinhood has had attracting young people to the stock market. I like the effort here, it's, but you have to have an account. You have to have your parents sign up for it. So that's a good way for them to add accounts. And they'll even throw in a debit card, Allison, just to sweeten the deal for you. But in general, we like the fact that Fidelity and other brokers are pushing financial literacy and investing education. We think everybody needs it. The fact is uh, too many people don't have it and lose money when they start investing or trading.
Yeah, and look, there are two words I like about that one. No fee. That's always a good thing, Caleb. I got one more for you on the streaming wars. Man, there has been a lot happening in this space this week. Amazon reportedly in talks to buy MGM for $9 billion. This rumor has kind of been circulating for a while, but it's getting some more play today. What would buying a film studio do for Amazon Prime Video and just the streaming space in general? Well, this would be a huge deal in Hollywood, but a very small deal for Amazon if they were to pull it off. Eight to eight to ten billion dollars. Yeah. Amazon's got seventy-two billion dollars in cash on hand right now, but they have two hundred million Prime subscribers worldwide that would love exclusive access to James Bond and Rocky and that huge library of MGM films. That film studio is one hundred and one years old. Think about the legendary films and classics that are in there. They would get that. Plus, you know, they got cash on hand to buy this, and even Jeff Bezos, the outgoing CEO of Amazon. He's going to need a new project. Why don't you make him the head of the studio? I'm sure he would love that. Oh, I bet he'd be in heaven. Hey, Caleb, I can't thank you enough. We usually see you on Fridays, but we couldn't wait, so we called you up on a Tuesday. We're very grateful to have you on News Now anytime we see you. Anytime. Thank you. Is home ownership still a part of the American dream? These days, it doesn't always look that way. U.S. home prices are soaring, forcing first-time buyers into bidding wars and making affordable housing even harder to find. NBC's Sanika Dange shows us what's happening with housing in Orlando. Amy Kaufholtz and our family have spent three years saving to buy a house. This is a dream we've had for a long time, and we finally feel like we're capable over the last two months, they say they've seen every listing in their price range. If you don't see it within the first 24 hours, the chances are you won't see it. They made five offers at or over asking price. All of them have been lost to cash buyers who are offering at least 15 to 20,000 over asking. So they upped their budget by $25,000. Still no luck. Every Sunday night, um, typically after we've lost another offer, I end up in tears and just wonder if it's worth it. What's the biggest reason why these prices are so high? We have an influx of cash buyers from out of state, especially those more expensive states, and they're overbidding compared to what the local buyers are paying. The number of homes for sale in the Orlando area has plunged more than 60 percent in the past year. Inventory is so low it would take only three weeks to sell all the homes currently on the market. Far less than the six months experts say is typical for this area. And in the age of remote work, many are relocating, especially to certain areas. For sale inventory is down more than 30 percent compared to last year. Universal NBC's sister company has announced plans to dedicate 20 acres of land for 1,000 affordable apartments. A task force is also working to increase housing options. But for now, the market is tough for renters, too. How are the rental options? Uh, rentals pretty much similar to the housing market. There's inventory that's pretty low uh, because we have specifically a lot of renters that want to buy, but due to the housing price have been so high, they have to renew their leases. It took Lacey Wolver six months to find an apartment to rent. We are a two-income family with no children, so we have more disposable income than a lot of couples our age. Still, they'll be paying over budget. For the average Orlando resident, do you think that there are affordable options? No. It's almost like they can't afford to live where they work. Does this feel like the American dream to you? No. <laughs> Not in the slightest. There's no real hope right now for first time home buyers, and it's been really sad. Prince Harry and Oprah Winfrey joining forces for a new documentary series focusing on mental health. Apple TV dropping the trailer as Prince Harry takes some heat for his comments on the First Amendment. NBC News Now anchor Joe Fryer has more. All over the world, people are in some kind of mental, psychological, emotional pain. Oprah Winfrey and Prince Harry together again, this time for the Me You Can't See, a series featuring candid discussions around mental health they hope a lot of people will see. What words have you heard around mental health? Crazy? Lost it. Can't keep it together. The trailer shows a clip of 12-year-old Harry at his mother, Princess Diana's funeral. Also profiled... I've been through it and people need help. Lady Gaga, Glenn Close, and many more. To make that decision to receive help is not a sign of weakness. 
In today's world, more than ever, it is a sign of strength. Meghan Markle also appears in the trailer alongside her husband. Both she and Harry have been speaking honestly about their personal journeys with mental health. In their interview earlier this year with Oprah, It takes so much courage to admit that you need help. And last week, during Harry's appearance on Dax Shepard's Armchair Expert podcast, where he also drew criticism for comments about the First Amendment while talking about the paparazzi. Yeah, I got so much I want to say about the First Amendment. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, I still don't understand it, but it is bonkers. But as Harry and Meghan open up about their lives, they're also opening themselves up to more scrutiny. I think what is beginning to irritate a lot of people on this side of the pond is the constant demands for privacy. And yet we now know more about Prince Harry and Meghan Markle than we did before because they've chosen to lift the lid on a lot of very private matters. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have been delving into numerous projects on this side of the pond. Partnerships with Procter & Gamble, Netflix, and Spotify. Meghan's upcoming children's book, inspired by her husband and son. Harry's new Silicon Valley job, and now his new series about mental health. Hoping that by sharing his personal story, he can help save lives. The results of this year will be felt for decades. For kids, families husbands, wives, everybody. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.